Welcome back. Uh, this is Module 3A. We are going to be looking at uh, the financial plan portion of the business plan and some of the basics that are involved. Our objectives for this week, which uh, consists of two modules, this module plus uh, a mo the following module on financial uh, plan examples or, or spreadsheets uh, that you can use to develop your uh, financial statements. Uh, there are two modules and the objectives is to understand as it says here the financial objectives of entrepreneurial ventures. We'll talk about pro forma financial statements. Pro forma is from the Latin for form and we'll explain what that means and also some of the bad connotations that it uh, pro forma has received in recent years. There are five sheets that will be needed as part of the business plan, five different uh, statements, sets of numbers, cash flow projections, income and expense or profit loss, a balance sheet that we'll talk about, a break-even analysis, and you should have seen this in prior courses, so you should know what this is, and finally, sources and applications of funds. Where are we going to get our money for startup, and how are we going to use it? Section I of the business plan is the financial plan, and again, as I just went through, uh, there are five basic pieces and we're going to talk about each of them in turn. What do we need to worry about financial management for? Uh, what does it do for us? Well here's, uh, here's a chart that kind of gives it in a, in a nutshell. Uh, we have to look at finances on an ongoing basis to see if we're making money or losing money. Obviously if we're losing money we have to change some things. Uh, do we have enough cash on hand to meet the rent, the payroll, the phone bill? Because as we'll find out, uh, cash and profit are not always the same thing. How well are we using our assets? How well are we managing things? Our investors and our lenders want to know that. And uh, can we share the risk? Can we partner with other people? Uh, how, how do we run the business? And, and again, it all revolves around finance. Here's another way of looking at the financial objectives of the firm. Four categories. Profitability. You can read the chart. The definition is there. It's going to take a while for a new firm to become profitable and you have to realize that and uh, you know it says here training employees building their brands of course marketing has a lot to do with that frequently there's startup costs in terms of research and development and getting a product out into the marketplace so that that's a uh, a real concern liquidity has to do with cash flow again can you pay your bills can you meet your payroll how well are you using its, its assets? Uh, as it points out, Southwest Airlines. The time the planes sit on the ground is wasted time being loaded and reloaded. Uh, airplanes only make money when they're flying. And airlines have to reduce the uh, turnaround time. Uh, you'll see as, as we go along, this also involves things like uh, inventory turns. A very similar kind of thing. And obviously stability, you want to be in there for the long term. Hopefully your business doesn't uh, start up, uh, get going, and then go out of business within a year. You, you want to be there for the long term. We have to come up with some first cut budgets, an operating budget, a capital budget, Pro forma, as I said a few moments ago, stands for for form. 
In this context, it means a first cut, a first draft, uh, some guesses, lots of assumptions regarding the numbers, you know, not a final product at this point in time. Operating budgets, again, focus on ongoing costs, capital budgets are the things for the new equipment, the initial startup, uh, building out the space that you're perhaps renting if you don't buy a building, uh, you know, fitting it out the way you need it, and, uh, you know, sales projections, things like that. Here's another look at basically the same thing. Where we're starting with the sales forecast and doing a break even analysis and coming up with some budgets. Now, unfortunately, the word pro forma has gotten a bad connotation. In the supplemental reading for tonight, there uh, is an is an article labeled proforma.pdf. I would ask you to look at that. This is really the second page of that, but uh, what it amounts to is that for a number of years prior to passage of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act that we'll talk about later in the course, uh, which tried to clean up some of the problems, companies were using pro forma statements to uh, mislead investors. They were uh, pumping up sales and earnings and uh, cooking the books as it were and it cost Arthur Anderson their, uh, the business. They, they went out of business as you know. What's left of them is now Accenture. Uh, you'll see, I don't expect you to be able to read it from this chart, but if you look at the uh, proforma.pdf you'll see that Network Associates, and I had the uh, Experience. I don't know if it was a pleasure, but it was an experience uh, to work with them for a little while out of uh, Maryland. Uh, if you look at the chart, basically what happened was they owned McAfee, the virus antivirus software, and McAfee was losing money. What they did is when they reported its earnings, uh, they reported a net loss of... 17 cents per share, but if you look at the asterisks, uh, it says that uh, it uh, it excludes the losses of McAfee. They just conveniently left that chunk of the business out of its operating results, and if they had included uh, McAfee in there, they would have lost. 35 cents per share and uh, very misleading a lot of people you know some people got in trouble for it got some fines and uh, the SEC came uh, came down on them so again uh, pro forma has got this uh, connotation or had this connotation until just very very recently of uh, again cooking the books misleading uh, people doctoring the numbers as it were but, of course, uh, you're not going to do that, I know, and uh, the idea of pro forma in the context of a startup, you know, again, is first cut assumptions. Okay. Sales forecasts. First thing we do is come up with some forecasted sales. How much of a product or service are we going to sell? Looking at uh, how it will grow or decrease perhaps over the long term, uh, how we're going to price it, are we going to price it uh, you know, at the same level all the way through or are we going to offer initial discounts to, to gain market share or are we going to uh, raise the price a little bit uh, initially because we don't have much competition. Is there competition? What are the effects of the competition? Well, there are ways that we can get our sales forecast numbers. We can do some marketing research and we'll talk about marketing research later in the course. 
look at industry sales again through marketing research uh, there are things out on the web and in books that can tell us where you know what uh, our expectations should be talk to the buyers if you have a sales force you can use them but in the beginning maybe you want to go to a consultant maybe you want to go to uh, look at some expert opinions maybe you want to go we talked about uh, the small business incubators and the uh, small business development centers at the county colleges in, in uh, last week and perhaps you want to go talk to those folks and kind of let them give you a feel for what is a reasonable expectation for a sales force, a sales forecast rather. One of the things you should be aware of is that there are two kinds of accounting and uh, this is important. You should know this if you've had a finance course. It should be uh, repetitious, I hope. Cash accounting, very simply, you when you pay the money, when you receive the money, uh, you record it. And on expenses, when you actually pay the bill, you record it. Well, the problem with the big problem with cash accounting, and it's uh, a theor more of a not a theoretical problem, but uh, despite that, most let me say that most small businesses use cash accounting. My own business, uh, we use cash accounting. It's much simpler uh, and straightforward. And as long as you understand the downsides of cash accounting, it's fine. However, one of what the downside is is that it doesn't time phase the revenues and expenses very well. So what happens is uh, you'll spend money to get. Uh, supplies, materials for your business to produce a product uh, and your profits will go way way down because you've got lots of expenses and you haven't sold anything. Then when you sell that chunk of product, that batch uh, of product, you get a lot of income. So the, the chart, the profit and loss chart goes way down below into a loss, then it bounces back up, then it bounces back down, and it's very hard to, to find a, where the steady state is. So the accountants came up with accrual accounting many, many years ago, and what you do is you take and record uh, the revenues at the time of that you sell a product or you build for the service, but you may not have collected it, all right? And the question is, is okay, where, where do those, uh, where does that get recorded? So you record the sale, very simply, as income, and the corresponding entry is that it goes into something called accounts receivable and I hope you've heard of that term okay accounts receivable is an asset it's money that is owed to you but hasn't been collected all right in similar fashion kind of the mirror image is you on, a, on expenses what you do is you record the expense when you actually make the commitment or, or get the thing buy the thing, put it on the credit card, but you don't necessarily pay for it at that point in time. And again, that becomes a liability and it's known as accounts payable. Depreciation also factors into that and depreciation is the amount uh, of money that is written off over different periods of time to write down an asset as it uh, loses its value. For example, uh, a truck. If the truck has a, an expected lifetime of five years, you can't write off the entire expense. And when you purchase it, what you do is you uh, depreciate the value of that asset over five years, and that becomes an expense. Inventory, usually considered finished goods inventory, or it could be supplies. Uh, can also factor into the numbers and there are different ways of valuing inventory it's a little bit beyond this course to go into details 
but you'll see a uh, again another supplemental reading handout called inventory.pdf and uh, this is basically what it is and it shows that a, a scenario where you purchase supplies products materials for, for what you need at different points in time at different prices depending upon the market price and how you value that as you use it uh, can affect your margin or your profit. Uh, all of them are right, different industries use different methods. This specific identification method uh, is used a lot in government type work. The federal government, particularly Department of Defense, wants to know the cost of the items or materials in the batch of, of product that they received. So they want specific uh, lot identification. The software can handle that uh, these days and it works out. One of the things that uh, we have to look at is an income and expense statement. All right, Sometimes called a profit and loss. Depends upon the industry. Again, you have to get to know your industry, know the uh, nomenclature that they use, the terms, talk the talk and walk the walk. So learn something about the industry. This is a, a simple income and expense. You should have seen this again in prior courses. Uh, your gross receipts or revenue or sales is the money coming in, whenever, whether it's cash or, or accrual depending on sales and again accrual accounting, uh, you'd have this thing called accounts receivable. The cost of goods sold is the cost per unit that it costs to make this thing, direct labor, uh, materials, uh, energy. We'll see later that sometimes, you know, variable costs are a little bit hard to measure, but we'll talk about that uh, a little bit further on in the course. So what we sell it for, minus what it costs us to make it, is our gross profit or gross margin, in this case $40 or $40,000. Expenses are our overhead, our salaries, our rent, our phone bill, uh, the electric bill generally. Advertising, a whole variety of things, as we'll see in the next module, that comes off of the gross margin. Depreciation, we talked about. This would be the annual or quarterly or semi annual uh, write off of the asset. What's left is a net profit, in this case, 18000 We pay tax on that, and we have a net profit after tax. Now, you can take a real income and expense sheet and no matter how complicated it is, no matter how big the company, it has to come down to basically this or what's on the previous chart. Uh, if it's very confusing then probably they're trying to hide something. So you know it, it should all filter down to something as simple as Revenues or net sales, cost of sales, gross margin, your expenses, as you can see, pre-tax earnings, uh, taxes, and how much you net it. Pretty much straightforward. Now the idea is uh, gross margin. All right, and you'll see on on the Lowe's example here they have percentages. You don't always have to show that, but many companies do. Different kinds of industries work at different net profit ratios or net margins. The uh, pharmaceuticals work at a pretty good margin although that's starting to come down now from competition of, place of the generics. Uh, things like Lowe's, uh, companies like Lowe's and uh, supermarkets work on very low net margins. All right, uh, But look at the difference between the gross margin and the net margin. 
Uh, take Pfizer, for example. About 70%. Uh, and where does that go? Well, that's not, that's, if you go back, and uh, I won't flip back through the chart, but uh, if you go back to the prior chart there, where the difference between gross margin, which is revenue minus the cost of the goods sold is gross margin, and then you deduct the expenses to get net margin. It says that their expenses are about 70%. Well, a lot of that in the pharmaceuticals is uh, research and development, very, very heavy. Things like uh, supermarkets and that don't have the R&D costs, so their overhead is considerably less as an industry. Uh, most of their overhead is operating costs, the store, costs of the store, the costs of uh, the employees who get salaries and uh, that kind of thing. But again, you have to look at your industry and what's good in one industry might not be good in another and vice versa. Our second form of sheet or, or report that we need in the business plan is a cash flow, a pro forma cash flow. Coming up with some first cut numbers. This example is based upon a an a, a cruel system. Why? Because it shows uh, accounts receivable, okay, which haven't been collected, gets deducted from the net income because your net income, don't forget, you took the $13,000 credit for it when it was sold, but if you haven't collected it, you really don't have $13,000 in cash. You've only got, at a minimum, nine. Okay. Depreciation. That helps your cash flow a little bit because uh, you can take money out of the asset, uh, perhaps, and uh, credit it to that. Accounts payable uh, helps your cash flow because you haven't paid the bills yet. You owe the money, but the cash is still sitting there. So you have a total of 17000 and uh, you figure that you add that to the cash you had at the beginning, and you come up with the cash at the end. Cash flow is very important. Again, you could be making a profit, but if you don't collect that profit, you may not have the money to meet your payroll at the end of the week or the end of the month. Uh, you may not have the money to pay the rent or the phone bill. Here's a real, again, here's a real cash flow statement, similar to the profit loss that I showed you. It's from Lowe's. Again, um, a little bit more complicated than our sample, but again, if you look at it, it really isn't different from the basic format, and it should be understandable. Again, if it's not, then there's something wrong. Balance sheet is the third it consists of a number of things. Uh, it's important to note that the cash flow statement and the income and expense or profit and loss statements are for a period of time. Okay, either for a week, a month, a quarter, six months, or a year or longer. It covers a period of time. The amount of profit we made this year. Uh, our cash flow for this year. The balance sheet, on the other hand, does not represent a period of time. It's a snapshot. It's as of a certain date. We list the current assets. Again, this is an accrual. We're looking at an example from an accrual system because we have accounts receivable sales that we've made but we haven't collected the money. Okay, Current assets are defined, as you should know from a fi the finance course, uh, as assets that are either cash or readily convertible to cash, something that we could liquidate if we had to to pay off bills. Long-term assets, on the other hand, are not liquid. 
things that are hard to get rid of, things like equipment, a building, if you don't own real estate in the building that you're in, that would be in there. And again, you see the write down of the asset via depreciation. And of course, the total is the total assets. The other side of the balance sheet, usually the right hand side, is liabilities and again we have current liabilities which are accounts payable, the things, the money we owe but haven't paid the bills yet for and the amount of money that we have to pay that's outstanding on our long-term debt. This could be interest that's accrued, uh, could be the payments on a loan, that kind of thing. Again, stuff that's due now. And similarly to the assets, long-term liabilities are things that are not yet due. And these may be long-term lo loans, a mortgage, uh, basically notes, uh, notes and mortgages, those kinds of things uh, that are, are not going to come due for quite some time. So we've got the total liabilities. The difference between liability, between assets minus liabilities equals the owner's equity. In your own life, in your own personal uh, net worth, you figure out what you own, what you've got and own, minus what you owe, and the difference is what your net worth is. That may be a negative number in some cases, but for example, if you have a car and you have a car loan against it, well, the value of the car minus the unpaid portion of the car loan is the net worth of the car. And again, at times, you know, the car may be worth less than the loan balance, but that happens. But in this case, assets minus liabilities equals owner's equity, or the other way of saying it on the balance sheet is assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. And it has to balance. Okay? If you turn in a business plan with a balance sheet that doesn't balance, you're going to lose some points because uh, particularly at, at this stage, uh, this is a graduate course, you should understand balance sheets, you should have had a finance course and you know, know what you have to do. Here's a real balance sheet again from Lowe's uh, and guess what, it balances. Again, not, uh, not too complicated. Current assets, total assets, long-term assets. Uh, current and long-term liabilities for total liabilities and the difference is the shareholders' equity. Our fourth statement or fourth sheet that we need sources and applications of funds. I talked about this a little bit at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, here's where a new business might get its, its money, make some money from operations, hopefully. Depreciation of the assets, recovering that cost. Taking a mortgage. Note personal funds, and when we talk about funding the organization, we'll see more about that. We'll talk more about that. You have to have your own personal funds in there. If you expect somebody else to either lend you money or invest in your business, uh, they had better be able to see that you have your assets, your personal money, your personal savings committed to this business otherwise they're not going to take you seriously. How are we going to use the money? We're going to buy some equipment, some inventory, we may have to start repaying the loan right away. And what's left over, when hopefully there is, hopefully we have money, we get more money than we have to put out right away, we have an increase in working capital and that's to keep us alive while 
uh, the business gets going and grows. So those are the four. Okay, to recap. All right, again, important. Cash flow is not the same as profit. Uh, we talked about accrual systems and cash systems. You've got to watch cash flow because, again, uh, a, well, a professor that I had way back when said, you really understand what it is to be the boss and own your own business when it's payday and you don't have enough money to meet the payroll. Your employees are not very happy. They may be understanding, but they're certainly not happy. Fortunately, the software today, things like QuickBooks and uh, Peachtree, uh, can flip from a, an accrual basis to a cash basis, can show you cash flow, can show you profit and loss uh, without keeping different sets of books. They can give you all these kinds of reports very, very easily. And I certainly recommend that if you set up a business, go look at something like QuickBooks or, again, uh, Peachtree Accounting. Uh, QuickBooks is, is uh, supposedly the more popular. We use it. Uh, our client, many of our clients use it, and it's, uh, it's a good system. Some problems, you know, looking at different scenarios. Uh, run the numbers. Do some what-ifs, and we're going to talk about that in the next module. Yeah. And, of course, if you have uh, money coming in and, and you're fortunate that you have a positive cash flow and extra money sitting in the bank account uh, or cash register, put it into a short-term a money market account, put it into a short-term CD, something like that, uh, where it can earn some interest. Don't let it sit there idle. That's a, you know, a waste of, of income and a waste of money. Well, here again, we've got um, an example of a business that uh, fell under its own weight. It's actually a cheese company. Suprema Specialties, and I don't expect you to read this chart, uh, but again, in the supplemental reading, you have uh, Too Good, the article Too Good, and you should be able to read that. And uh, basically, the problem, if you look at that supplemental, you can pull that chart up now if you want, PDF chart uh, or article, that... Uh, they messed up their cash flow. All right, they had too much inventory. They had too much accounts receivable sitting out there that they didn't collect, and uh, the business just went went under. And it kind of gives you an example of uh, how not to run a business. All right, our fifth. chart, it was actually fourth in the listing, but it can either be fourth or fifth. It's a break-even analysis, and again, I hope you've seen this before. I hope this, uh, this lecture is very repetitive, because, but if it's not, uh, we have to have this foundation to make sure we're all talking the same terms. As the chart says, neither a break-even is where you incur neither a profit nor a loss. You've got to cover both your variable and fixed expenses. What does it look like? Well, we've got fixed costs down at the bottom. Those are, they don't vary with the amount produced. You have that same cost whether you produce one unit or a thousand units. It's things like the rent advertising, uh, salaries, fixed salaries for your people, uh, perhaps your electric bill, depending upon the industry, uh, your electric bill, your phone bill, those kinds of things. We add on top of that the variable costs, and variable costs vary per unit. So again, uh, going back to week one with that uh, little uh, soda fountain kiosk, our sodas were six cents per soda. That was the cost of goods sold, right? The actual cost to produce per a per unit soda. 
So that the slope of that line is the unit cost. So it's unit cost times the volume. When that's added on top of the total on top of the fixed cost, we have a total cost. Then what we have to do is overlay our revenue line. Our revenue is based upon our selling price times the volume. And at some point, that revenue line crosses the total cost line, and that's our break-even point. It is that simple. Now, are these numbers always straight lines? No, not necessarily. Uh, you know, at some point you can the variable cost may change if you're getting a lot more. Uh, you may be able to buy in bulk and uh, reduce your per unit costs, the variable cost, to a, a lower slope. And uh, we have to look at it. So it, it can get a little more complicated. Let's take a look at an example. This happened to be a uh, An air ambulance business, all right, for uh, a medical medical center, uh, but it could be an airline, uh, similar things. Particularly since it talks in terms of flights, but it could be could be any business if we get rid of the word flights. Again, this chart is is telling us what. It's telling us that this kind of business has a big fixed cost. In the case of a helicopter or an airplane, uh, yeah. There, there's uh, whether it has one passenger or one flight or not or a hundred flights, uh, you still got that same fixed cost. The variable costs tend to be uh, the fuel and maybe uh, in the case of the medical supplies, uh, in the case of the medical ambulance rather air ambulance, uh, medical supplies that are used uh, on each flight. But uh, again, a relatively small number. What about the pilots? Well, chances are the pilots are a fixed cost because they're going to get paid a fixed salary whether or not they are responding to a flight or just sitting around waiting for a call to come in. So again, you see our break-even point at 503. Another example. Let's take a look at pricing. Here's a, a sample where we've got uh, what do we charge for a box of cereal? What? We know that we've got our fixed costs here. We know what our variable cost is to produce a box of cereal. Our marketing department, our sales forecast, if you go back to the almost the beginning of this lecture, our sales forecast has told us that uh, if we sell it at two bucks a box, we can sell 290,000. If we sell it for three bucks a box, fewer people are going to buy it. The competition's going to uh, take some of our market share. So we'll only sell 210. Where's the break even point? The break even point at a two dollar price is we need four hundred thousand boxes we need to sell four hundred thousand boxes of cereal at two dollars per box to break even our marketing department tells us we can't sell that so we're now we're going to operate in a loss okay if we bring it up to three hundred three dollars a box, we only need two hundred thousand units to break even. And our marketing people, assuming they're right, say we can sell that. So it would make sense. It would make sense to sell it at three dollars a box with a lower volume and make money on it. Let me back up for a second to the break-even analysis here. 
and make sure that uh, again the point that I overlooked but make sure that you understand that to the left of the break-even point where the total cost line is higher than the total revenue line the company's operating at a loss we are losing money to the right of the break-even point where the total revenue line is above the total cost line up here in uh, this area right here that's where we're starting to make a profit okay and that's uh, that's where you want to be so it's it's quite simple but you're gonna have to do this for your business and have to submit this as part of your plan where do you expect to break even okay in the next module uh, 3b for this week we're going to look at spreadsheets that you can use uh, to do these what-if scenarios some testing some projections for the first year and those spreadsheets are available to you and uh, again we'll explore them and go through them in the next module thank you